Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Jacqueline Witt, professor of strategy at the U.S. Army War College and the editor for A Better Peace. One of the most fundamental questions a society and a military must ask is who's going to serve in the military and on what terms? Is military service a right, a choice, an obligation? Uh, What are the requirements to serve? What's the relationship between those who serve and the state? Does military service confer special privileges or status? And since the end of the Vietnam War, does the military service confer special privileges or status? Since the end of the Vietnam War, the United States has employed an all-volunteer force while retaining the requirement for selective service registration for American men. But during the Vietnam War, when a draft was employed, the relationship between individuals and military service was constantly being negotiated. To talk about how the military and the broader society approach this fundamental question about the nature and requirements of military service during the Vietnam era is Dr. Amy Rutenberg. Amy is an assistant professor of history at Iowa State University, whose research focuses on the relationships among war, gender, militarization, and American society in the second half of the 20th century. In her first book, which is called Rough Draft, Cold War Military Manpower Policy and the Origins of Vietnam-Era Draft Resistance, will be out in the fall of 2019. Amy, thanks for joining us here on War Room. Thanks so much for having me. So I want to start with a question sort of about the all-volunteer force. And I think we've become accustomed in the years since Vietnam to the idea that people choose to enter the military, and we understand uh, that the draft and resistance to the draft during the Vietnam War was a major factor in sort of shifting the United States away from conscription. So can you start by telling us a little bit more about the history of conscription in the U.S. and how manpower requirements, I guess now we'd say person power requirements, (laughs) um, in the U.S. military were sort of met during the Vietnam War? Sure. And I I will be using the term men because only men were were liable to the draft. So that that makes sense within the context. Um, So the U.S. has a long history of using a draft. Even before there was the United States, there were drafts during during wartime, um, the Revolutionary War on up. Confederates, the Union, on and on. Um, But the goal was to keep the force in being small between uh, moments of emergency when the draft was needed, um, up until the end of World War II, essentially. Uh, Once the draft was put in place in 1940, as the needs of the United States, um, both for for occupation governments and then combined with the nascent Cold War, it turned out that the U.S. was not real comfortable giving up the draft. So with one brief exception for about 18 months between 1947 and 1948, uh, the draft has remained in place from 1940 until 1973. So um, it was not used extensively during times of peace through those decades between World War II and Vietnam, with the exception of Korea. Um, But primarily it was used to spur enlistment. The idea was that men who were under the threat of conscription would choose to enlist because they would be better able to control the terms of their enlistment. Mm -hmm. So they could choose um, maybe which service, a little bit more control over where they went and how. Uh, So we would call these sort of draft-induced volunteers, right? Yeah, exactly. And they they would oftentimes get a little bit more choice in terms of MOS as well. Mm -hmm. So what they did, where they went, which branch of service. And that that tradition sort of continues all the way through Vietnam. There's plenty of people who volunteer for for service under the threat of of conscription. so one of the one of the concepts that that you talk about is uh, martial citizenship. So I want to explore what this phrase means that might be new to some of our our listeners. Um, so specifically during Vietnam, but sort of before and after, if that makes sense. What what does this phrase mean, and how do we understand what martial citizenship is? Sure. So um, it's it's kind of a slippery term. Um, I think that for most people, it doesn't have much meaning at all. Um, you know, scholars use it, though, to talk about something that I think most Americans would be familiar with, which is the concept that since soldiers serve the state, the state, therefore, owes something back. 
Um, so martial citizenship becomes the rights and um, privileges that people who have served in the military therefore are considered to deserve as a result of their sacrifice for the state. Um, the GI Bill is probably the most obvious example um, mm -hmm. in that, you know, returning veterans from World War II, you know, gained a whole host of benefits as a result of their service from low interest loans to paying for education, on and on. Um, but martial citizenship can also be expanded beyond that in that it can also include sort of the, the added weight or authority that comes to veterans by virtue of their military service. Um, but it's not, it, it doesn't always mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. And by the time of the Vietnam War, um, manpower policies had sort of shifted in such a way that the way that policymakers themselves were using the concept, if not the term, uh, they were being, they were applying it to particular groups of people. Okay, so let's talk about how um, particular groups of people sort of experience this idea uh, differently. Because we, we know that the draft is sort of unevenly applied because there's, even with m greater manpower requirements, not everyone has to has to serve in the military. And so they're going to be people who are sort of on the inside and outside. Um, so can you walk us through some of these different groups and how the concept of martial citizenship sort of is differently applied or differently thought about? Sure. So I would argue that the concept sort of, in many people's minds, if, if they're not using the term, definitely the concept has sort of crystallized within the years after the debate over the GI Bill, that people who serve in the military deserve certain rights and privileges, um, particularly at this moment, material privileges. Um, you know, uh, preferential hiring treatment, the loans, the education, and so on. Mm -hmm. But within the context of the Cold War, there were men who really didn't necessarily need these benefits, as well as the fact that the whole deferment system that gets, starts to get put in place from the Korean War forward, uh, the deferments for students, for men in STEM fields, for actually fathers who are breadwinners, the men are deferred because they are acting in the national interests, as opposed to just trying to keep the economy vibrant or, or arsenal stocked as during World War II. During the Cold War, which is a lot more technological, it's an economic, it's an ideological war, men as civilians who are in these particularly middle class roles are serving the state. They're defined that way actually by the Selective Service. And by 1955-56, the director of Selective Service is calling this manpower channeling. That men who can serve the state as civilians are being channeled into these roles by getting deferments. They're essentially being bribed to go so ahead that, and go into So that military roles. service isn't the only way to demonstrate service to the state. And the reason that I start there to talk about the Vietnam War and the way martial citizenship functioned by the time of the Vietnam War is because the flip side of that coin is that by 1963, the military rejection rate, those men who are being conscripted but who can't qualify, they don't end up being inducted, but they receive their draft notices and can't, can't pass their exams, that's being identified as a major problem in American society. And a whole host of actors and plans, uh, the actors, particularly Secretary of Labor Willard Wirtz, Director of Selective Service Louis B. Hershey, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, they begin to identify this rejection rate as a serious problem and look for ways and programs to use military service as a way to, quote, rehabilitate these men. And through military service, these men are supposed to gain job skills, literacy skills, health remediation, all these things that we would call martial citizenship, that they're to gain through their service that they can go and take out back to the civilian world. The goal was to strengthen the United States as a whole society um, on the civilian side by using military service to offer martial citizenship to these men specifically. So it becomes a way to sort of Americanize and, and have have these men sort of enter the full, um, I guess, sort of scope of American citizenship and what that, what that essentially requires um, for the state. So these are different from draft deferments. Correct. Uh, and these are so these are these are determinations about qualifications. Well, it's partially about qualifications because it's at this moment that some of the standards for letting men into the military begin to drop. 
Um, there are also rehabilitation programs that are piloted through um, induction centers, where when men fail their pre-induction exams, they are at that moment referred out for job training and other things, mm -hmm. um, which would theoretically, particularly for those men who are rejected for health reasons or literacy reasons, if they could overcome that problem, then they would actually be then eligible for the draft. Eligible for, for service. Right. Um, but it culminates with the creation of Project 100,000 in 1966. Okay. So let's talk let's talk a little bit more about Project 100,000 and can you maybe before before we dive into that can you talk a little bit more about who who these men who aren't meeting qualifications whether those are health or um, sort of literacy requirements. So are there, I imagine there have to be sort of racial and class-based yes, absolutely lines that are that are evident in these in these qualifications too. Yes, so the Task Force on Manpower Conservation begins its work in, I think, 64. Um, and basically what it finds is that um, the men who are rejected for military service are overwhelmingly, disproportionately men of color, uh, some white working class men in the South, um, so there are vast regional differences, racial differences, and class differences. And the hope is to identify what uh, Secretary of Labor Wirtz called the 25% or so of men who, as he put it, unquestionably caused 75% or more of the nation's social problems. Mm -hmm. so, the, so then Project 100,000 is instituted, and what's, it, what's the impetus for it, and what is it trying to do? So there's a lot of discussion around where it came from and why, and I would argue that it, it did legitimately grow out of this desire through the war on poverty to strengthen American manhood uh, by creating better breadwinners, by creating men who could earn a living for themselves and their families and then thus lift themselves up out of poverty. Uh, however, it happened to overlap with escalation in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, so it ends up being kept, I think, for as long as it was. And it operated from 66 to 71. Um, of 354,000 men were brought in under its auspices to all branches of military service, both voluntarily and through the draft. Um, and the purpose um, was to bring in these men who were otherwise unqualified for service, usually because they couldn't pass the aptitude exams, and theoretically provide them training within the military to take back home after discharge. Um, however, they did overwhelmingly end up in infantry positions because they didn't necessarily qualify for other MOS positions. Um, and they were heavily disproportionately men of color. Uh, this is a period of time where though the numbers fluctuate a bit, the, the overall military is somewhere around 9 or 10% African-American. New standards men who are the men brought in under, under Project 100,000 or 40% African-American. And I did find one document saying that they, they wished it had been up to 60%. Mm -hmm. So this sounds, I mean, this is a really complicated story then and once you have lots of crisscrossing and intersecting <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, lines and, no 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 I think no, this is this is this is really interesting because it I think it demonstrates the complexity of, of of manpower policies when you think about what are the what are the broader social and cultural and political and economic implications of military service who who has access to those to the to the rights and benefits of veterans if you if you are unqualified to serve you can never access those things and at the same time if you're conscripted to serve in infantry positions in the Vietnam War um, that clearly puts your life and well-being at stake so so you've got um, really significant competing um, competing imperatives I guess yeah and one of the interesting things at this moment in time was that you have essentially what amounts to mostly white middle class men who are being targeted for deferment explicitly mm -hmm. and men of color and and white working class men who are being targeted for military service which is saying your 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 value to the state is right. is different and so it appears that right men of color are valuable to the state because of their bodies and white working white middle class men are valuable to the state in in sort of other in other ways i would say that that's how it looked you know looking from the out looking in um but the 
goal in all of the documentation that I have found is is essentially though to use military service that value for their bodies to help them gain sort of added value right. for after military service for the post military service to to sort of fulfill the rights and obligations of citizens exactly I mean, so th- yeah I think it's a I think it's a really it's it's a it's a too simple story. Uh, right to to say that the sort of race and and class lines are are the easiest um, ones to draw. You talked a little bit about um, draft deferments, but draft resistance is another sort of part of this of this story. Mm-hmm. So, how does our our understanding of draft resistance interact with the the story that you've already been telling? So, one of the things that I have noticed is that the policymakers, in particular, I've got some particularly great quotes from from Secretary of Labor Works, who I've mentioned before, but he's talking about military service as an opportunity, that when you talk about equalizing opportunity, he's not talking about let's end the deferments for college students so that everyone has the same opportunity to serve. Let's increase the number of people who are otherwise unqualified because they're the ones who are lacking opportunity. That martial citizenship needs to come from that direction. Mm -hmm. Draft resistors, uh, draft counselors, civil rights activists who are working in the anti-draft movement, um, they actually come at it from from a different way but almost end up with an ironically similar message, which is that you shouldn't be increasing You shouldn't be decreasing the opportunity for white men to gain their deferments. You need to be increasing the opportunities for black men and other disadvantaged men to gain deferments. So that the notion of martial citizenship Mm -hmm. to draft counselors and and other uh, people active in war resistance, it's a lie that that these, these supposed benefits that military service confers, they're not benefits because people aren't receiving them they're ending up in the in the battlefields of Vietnam. And so, you know, the the traditional sort of narrative story of of disadvantaged people using the military as a way to gain full citizenship is a lie. Mm-hmm. So instead, we need to increase their ability to to stay out of the draft to avoid it. So I think, again, this is it's such an interesting um, sort of twist on some of the some of the stories that we that we tell, I think, about Vietnam era draft. And as we think then about the implications of the move toward the all volunteer force and what that means as recruiting practices change, as um, en- enlistment rates change, as who's, you know, who serves and under under what terms and what does military service confer on on veterans if we jump maybe forward, and this is this is the part where historians start to start to hate me um, as the as the podcast host, is to think about what this historical story might um, have to say to us in the in the present moment, where we we have pretty good understanding of of now person power requirements of the the human power. Um, necessary to sustain the 21st century American military, um, whether that's gender and class, race, all of these things are still up for up for discussion, not to mention region, socioeconomic status, all of this stuff is a still complicated story. So if you were if you were talking to contemporary military professionals, strategist policymakers, what are some of the questions or themes that you might encourage them to think about? You know, I, I, I am a historian and I have struggled with how I want to answer this question. Um, I think that there there is a lesson to be learned about unintended consequences. This entire pyramid of deferments that was put in place through the 1950s and early 1960s was done to meet the needs of the moment in which the deferment was passed. Um, to meet Cold War needs in particular, but also as ways to actually thin down the manpower pool because there were too many men uh, as the baby boomers began Mm -hmm. to come of age, particularly before the United States actually uh, escalated its intervention in Vietnam. Because they actually need a relatively small number. 
Right. Compared to the total pool. And as long as men were uh, enlisting, even under the pressure of the draft, very few men actually needed to be drafted. But then what does that say if you have this massive available pool and you only take a few men? Right. Um, So there are unintended consequences that grow out of that. But I think that those unintended consequences, they're related to elements that we don't necessarily think about immediately when thinking about manpower issues. Um, Larger social forces, how we um, privilege certain statuses, how we look at race, how we look at class, how we look at gender. Um, And that matters. It, 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 It really does matter. Um, in all kinds of unintended ways. I also think that thinking about what is actually important and what what we feel as a, as a society that we owe our service members, it's not obvious, um, and it never was at any given time, that, that even in, in a post-GI Bill world, um, that military members deserve certain things or uh, have earned certain rights. Um, if that's something that's important to us as a society in general, then we need to think about how we deploy and protect those rights or those mm-hmm. rewards um, because they, they can be chipped away at. It's, it's not an obvious thing. As and, they're, and they're negotiated over time and, and things, things change. The relationship between the military and the society that it, that it protects um, is, is always, always one that's being uh, <laughs> negotiated and renegotiated throughout um, throughout time one of the one of the statistics I think that gets thrown around a lot these days is that um, only about 20 to 25 percent of Americans are even eligible for military service um, it turns out we don't really know where that number came from uh, <laughs> it's probably a really squishy number um, but we use it a lot and but so, that terror's always been there I mean yeah. going back to World War one you know who's eligible who's not right we're not a fit enough nation it, it's it's all connected it's a it's hundred years old no at least. no new no new <laughs> questions right civil uh, Civil War two right the the sort of accession standards and what is what is required for service and that changes depending on the nature of the of the conflict um, I, I imagine that if the United States went to war with China tomorrow we would suddenly find that many more then 25% of the American population is eligible uh, for conscription and eligible for service. So I think asking these these types of questions, thinking about the cross-cutting uh, relationships of race, class, gender, ethnicity, nation, uh, citizenship, all of these things um, matter. And we're still sort of dealing with the questions of martial citizenship um, today. So Amy, I'd like to thank you for coming, uh, joining us on War Room. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thanks so much for having me. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu and have a great day.